Good morning, everybody. I um, hope this microphone's working. Um, and welcome to the first session at what looks like it's going to be a wonderful occasion again, and the sun is shining. So I'm Helen Cheshire from the Woodland Trust, and I'm chairing this session on agroforestry, what have we learned along the way. So I'm delighted to say we've got two farmers who are very experienced agroforesters, Stephen Briggs, who I'm sure you all have heard of, who farms just south of Peterborough. And I'm not sure, Stephen, have you still got the largest silver arable scheme in the UK? Anyway, that's one for people to challenge. Um, and obviously, he has also advised numerous farmers to um, design and implement their own agroforestry schemes through his consultancy. And then we have David Rose, who farms a mixed care farm in Nottinghamshire and was inspired by Stephen, and um, he planted his first agroforestry scheme back in 2014. So you've got an opportunity to listen to their, to their journeys, but also to ask lots of questions to them um, at the end. But to set off, we have got Jim O'Neill, who is the agroforestry lead at the Forestry Commission, and Jeff Newman, who is the agroforestry lead at Natural England. And I've been involved in a small way in trying to help encourage farmers to think about the benefits on trees on farms for about the last decade and it's actually really really good news that we've now got Forestry Commission and Natural England both with dedicated agroforestry leads and I think it really demonstrates that the government are starting to realize that there's potentially really positive benefits for agroforestry to become a mainstream land use in helping us all tackle climate change, help to meet net zero, reverse the declines in nature whilst producing sustainable and resilient food systems. So we're going to hear from um, Jim and Jeff first, and then the then si Stephen and David, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. And then Philippa will join the panel. Philippa is head of catchment sensitive farming, and will be able to talk about the perspective of trees in terms of um, tackling water and air pollution. So. Um, and just one small announcement while I think about it. At the end of this session, my colleague, Paul, who may or may not be in the back, oh yes, he's lurking around at the back, is organizing a walk up to the silver arable scheme that the cherries have planted here. So if anybody wants to go to that, that's directly after this. So over to you, Jim. Okay, thank Thanks, Helen. Should have done this before, shouldn't I? So I could do my, all my hands. Okay, thanks, Helen, for that introduction. It's nice to see the tent so full, so uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I won't d uh, dwell too much on, on things because I know we, we're tight for time. So um, just wanted to um, reassure you that everyone on this stage is working really hard together with DEFRA to make sure that uh, we get, we're getting ag agroforestry on the map uh, and, and doing what you need it to do. So that's important. You're the people on the ground. You're the people with the land. Without you, we can't make it happen. So I just want to sort of set the context for change, really. Uh, this slide's from um, a, a DEFRA pilot called the Forestry Investment Zone, which was a forestry-based um, scheme in northeast Cumbria. But we uh, did a whole holding, whole farm audit, um, a small trial. And we basically got a forestry advisor and an agricultural advisor, both together around the farm table with the owners. Uh, and we did some sort of... Um, quite a, a number of things, but one of the things that came out at the other end was we went back to the farm and we pr um, asked them, following the report and the visit and advice, uh, what were their thoughts. The first pie chart says, you know, w do you plan any changes following the, the audit? And the, the, the vast majority were saying yes. Second one, up on the top right, was uh, do you plan to do any woodland creation or tree planting, field corners, that sort of thing? And again, a good portion of that uh, the green and the orange uh, were, were yes. So, that, you know, that was really encouraging. And the last one was perhaps most interesting. Where do you see your, your uh, business in 10 years' time? And the vast majority were um, looking at sustainable farming and diversification. And that, that was the main push. But worryingly, the, the sort of blue portion there were people looking at an exit strategy. And I believe that agroforestry, um, trees, woodland and forestry and agroforestry could provide opportunities to maybe reverse that, uh, that position because a lot of the farmers in that part of the world didn't have any succession and were looking at uh, really packing up. But if they could sort of intensify uh, agriculture on some areas and get some tree planting going and others, they may have another option. So what is agroforestry? Perhaps the best one 
uh, that we need to be most mindful of is the RPA definition. We keep them happy, we're all good. Uh, a set of land management systems where trees are deliberately combined with agriculture on the same piece of land. So just let's bear that in mind. That's what they want to see. And as long as we, we fit that uh, bill, we're okay. Uh, so I like to call agroforestry farming with trees. Agroforestry can tend to turn some people off as, as, a, as a sort of wacky sort of uh, exercise, but it's not. It's something we've done in this country for generations, centuries, but we've, we've sort of fallen out of love with it, uh, so perhaps since the war. Uh, but, it, you know, it's gathering pace and momentum again. So I think everything from hedgerows, hedgerows with trees, right through to small farm woodlands, it all fits into the agroforestry banner. Uh, why agroforestry? I, mean, uh, I mentioned that uh, diver divergence from farming and forestry, uh, and we've really had a binary choice. Is it farming? Is it forestry? And never, never the twain shall meet. So I, I think this is the first step. Agroforestry is the first step back to I integrated land management. Um, and we do, we need landowners, as I say. We can't uh, meet our sort of bi biodiversity, environmental uh, and monetary targets uh, without farmers and landowners planting trees on their land. So we've got to engage with them. So how do we engage with people who have, have not perhaps done so much uh, of this before? We've got to make trees, woodland and forestry relevant to farmers and landowners. So I, I won't go through the list, but you know, uh, shade, shelter, soil, water, live weight gain, all sorts of things that, that uh, uh, benefits are brought by, by agroforestry. can't see the screen here, so it's just checking. <laughs> so one of the things I always say to, to, to farmers when I'm, I'm out with them is look for connections to the business that you have and perhaps the peripheral businesses around the farm. What does your wife do, your, your partner, uh, your children? Have they got businesses a, a, a generated, uh, generating income from the farm? So um, gone too far now already. So um, yeah. I mean, it might be a, a div diversification enterprise that uh, trees, woodland, and forestry bring. So look for those connections. Really important. Think, think a bit more broadly about what trees, woodland, and forestry can bring to the, to the business. Okay, so last slide. Um, look for direct outcomes. How, how can trees, woodland, and forestry directly uh, affect what you do in a good way? You know, look for those, those animal husbandry opportunities, uh, soil, water, land management issues. Um, they, trees, woodland, forestry have to be relevant to you and how you manage your farm. If not, you're not going to be interested and we're not going to achieve what we need to achieve. So, thank you. Hello. Um, well, this is a picture of me in my traditional orchard in Gloucestershire. Um, and I joined the agroforestry role in February. And I want to explain today why Natural England are interested in agroforestry. So Natural England has signed up to the England Tree Action Plan, which is a threefold increase in trees. But we are keen to get the right trees in the right places. Um, we're working on nature recovery networks, which are helping us to deliver a strategic approach to nature recovery. And so we want to link up those treescapes for wildlife, for nature. And finally, there's the ELM schemes, and obviously we want to optimize the ELM schemes for nature as well. So why are agroforestry schemes good for nature? Well, they, they offer a diverse habitat structure. So within um, Natural England, we do research projects, and um, there was a research project on priority woodland species, and they found out that a lot of the species were associated with glades, with woodland edges, so all the light and open trees were where, where the wildlife was. And agroforestry can mimic that throughout, throughout the landscape. Um, it also has a direct benefit to, to wildlife. So um, traditional orchards and wood pasture are priority habitats in themselves, and they are agroforestry systems. So we're interested in those. And then finally, and more widely, widely um, it is the nature-based solutions that agroforestry can offer. It's, those, it's that reducing nutrient loss. It's that absorb absorption of water, reduction in flooding, all those kind of added benefits that you get from planting trees within a crop or within a grassland. 
So um, I've been working with DEFRA colleagues on the agroforestry standard for, for SFI and for LNR, um, um, ELM, so that's the Environmental Land Management Schemes. Um, and why, why, why are DEFRA doing that? Why are we leading on that? And what are our drivers? Well, the drivers are carbon capture, biodiversity, and nature-based solutions, as I've, I've, as I've previously mentioned. But what, what the idea is, is to offer a secure, low-risk entry into agroforestry through the standards but that will be financially attractive. They can hopefully fund capital and revenue items. And we'll work in partnerships with, with exemplary practitioners, uh, such as we have here today. Um, we'd like to have an agroforestry carbon code, I think some of us, but whether we get there or not is, is, a, is a mute point at the moment, I think, to say. Um, but we want flexible systems. So it's not just forestry, it's not just agriculture. We're integrating these landscapes and that's really key, I think, to, to how we do um, funding moving forward. So my last slide. Um, I think the future for agroforestry is bright. I put up a couple of, couple of slides there um, that I just took off the internet last week. So there was one about uh, cow burps being uh, taxed in New Zealand. And uh, the headline was there, but within the headline was the fact that um, farmers would be able to plant trees to offset their tax, which I thought was an interesting concept. But the, the most um, exciting one there is most English farmers willing to plant trees to combat climate change. And that was in the New Scientist report just a couple of weeks ago. So I think the time is great and good to get involved in, um, in agroforestry. And I'll hand over to Stephen now to talk more about practice. Morning all. Um, it, it reminded me here that if anyone's looking for Glastonbury, you're in the wrong place. Uh, and this is probably the worst band you'll ever see. But <laughs> hey -ho. So I farm uh, just a bit further north than here. Does that work? Yeah. Um, up, uh, up just near Peterborough. I'm a tenant farmer um, uh, on the edge of the city of Peterborough. Um, we're first generation farmers farming about 100, just over 110 hectares on a tenanted farm, which we took on in 2007. And the drivers for our uh, our business uh, doesn't seem to be working. There we go. No, apologies. What can we see there? Ah, that's interesting. It uh, it's jumping slides. Oh well, I'll carry on regardless. No, it doesn't matter. So the drivers for our business re really are a. Uh, I don't know what's happening here. Random. <laughs> random. Um, the drivers for our business really were to take a farm that had grown um, uh, all seed rape, sugar beet, potatoes, wheat for 40 years, and the soils were pretty exhausted, and the biodiversity was fairly fairly low, and have a more multifunctional land use, have more sort of enterprise and cropping diversity, rather improve the soils and protect them, and, and open up new market opportunities. So we set about actually planting an agroforestry system back in 2009, which seems like yesterday, but a few years have gone under the belt. And th this presentation is mainly really sort of pictures just to give you a flavour of it. Um, and what we did is we planted half the farm, so 52 hectares, based on a, uh, a sort of 24 metre uh, alley cropping system. Um, we had to leave uh, turning edges at the end so making sure that your your local IDB regulations are adhered to is, is an important lesson. So actually making sure that you don't contravene any local uh, legislation. Um, but that, that, that fitted the system quite well. And we, we said about, even though our neighbours thought we were completely mad, uh, we said about planting trees in, in 2007 across 52 hectares based on a 24 metre alley, um, uh, planting three metres between each uh, tree. And, and being tenants, we needed an economic return within 15 years, uh, the period of our tenancy. So we chose to use fruit trees, partly because it gave us an economic return and partly because um, actually we could add some value to the project produce fairly quickly. And also at that time, um, if I planted a, a tree crop at that time uh, of timber, I'd have had a dilapidation clause from my landlord saying I'd taken a land out of agricultural production. As a fruit tree, it was still an eligible crop. The position is different now. 
uh, as uh, Jeff has already said, the RPA now recognise agroforestry as a, as a valid land use system, so we wouldn't have the same barriers. So we set about planting that in 2009 um, and um, put in, where are we, we can see, uh, put in uh, four and a half thousand uh, fruit trees, one year olds. So one of the lessons for you from, from this session is you need to be thinking at least a year in advance. Don't expect to go and buy four and a half or five thousand trees off the shelf. You need to order those at least a year in advance, if not more. So you need, need to be talking to nurseries, nurseries well in advance. Um, in terms of actually getting things established, we had a bit of a baptism of fire, put the trees in in 2009, had the, the coldest winter in 15 years and then followed by the driest spring in 30 years. So you need to think about climate. Most of these trees that you plant will, will withstand the winters quite well and they'll withstand wet quite well. But actually, these kind of conditions are pretty brutal for young trees. So you might need to think about watering or mulching and retaining moisture. That might well be an issue. Think about the guards you're going to use, about the ties, um, and, and, and certainly uh, very much about sort of weed management. And one of the lessons for us was actually the, the actual dreadful quality of posts, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, larch or spruce from, I, I guess, Russia or wherever it came from, wasn't good enough quality. And after three or four years, we were having to replace a lot of posts. So I would invest in good quality posts to get these trees established. We, um, we, we under uh, planted all our tree strips with uh, pollen nectar mixtures and they work really well. We managed to form those as part of a countryside stewardship scheme or HLS as it was at the time. And so that provided some income as well. And they've delivered very well for nature. Uh, the only thing you need to think about is that they will change. They really will change over a period of time. So what you see in the first couple of years will change over a period of time to be different species. So you need to be thinking about the components of these over a 10 year period. In terms of machinery within the alley cropping, uh, all, all the farm machinery that we, we employ on the farm um, has worked pretty well. In fact, it's led to a controlled traffic farming system, not something I'd anticipated, but now all our machinery is six meters wide. So we, we tread in the same place all the time under a CTF system, both with drilling, with interrow hoeing, etc. And that's opened up new opportunities. Because by having a controlled traffic farming system, it allows us access to the crop to start thinking about companion planting. So now we're keeping the solar panels turned on with trees, with crops, and with an understory by having a three-layered system so that we always keep the solar panels turned on all year round. So it opens up different opportunities. The, the main sort of machinery on the farm uh, in terms of uh, uh, either drills or cultivators or hoes or, or combines has all worked. It's me that does the drilling and it's me that does the combining. So if, it, if I get it wrong, it's, it's only on my shoulders. Um, I don't know where we are in the presentation. There we go. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of the, the productivity of the trees themselves, uh, I guess that one of the biggest challenges is it takes five years for a fruit crop probably to get into, into some level of productivity. So the trees are quite young in the first in the first formative years. And you need to plan that into your cash flow. And then after five years, well, we started actually harvesting fruit um, and, and getting some, some economic return. With 52 hectares, we actually got uh, an, an economic cost recovery after about 7.8 eight years. So we had, a, we had a return on investment after sort of year eight. Um, key to uh, actually pollination, uh, we teamed up with a, a beekeeper. In fact, David and I use the same beekeeper, commercial beekeeper, and um, uh, having having good pollination services on the farm was key. So we have about 40 hives around the farm. Um, as long as DEFRA don't ask us to ear tag or EID bees, <laughs> we, we're good. Um, but uh, uh, they're they're really key key to the problem uh, to the system making it work. In terms of pests, um, as you can see from the photograph, we we put uh, at least I hope you can. Uh, we put uh, wire mesh guards around every tree to minimise the sort of canker damage to the trees and good airflow. We hadn't quite anticipated that the hairs on on the farm were as big as Labradors, so we had to go and put second um, second guards up because they were nibbling at the top of the trees. And, and the second issue, uh, which you can see from the next photograph, is that uh, we hadn't also anticipated we were creating four and a half thousand roosting posts for pigeons, uh, which was. Um, uh, 
a, a lesson learned that after a thousand trees have the tops broken out because when one pigeon comes it's not a problem when the second his mate comes along they break the top of the tree out we solved it by putting a 10, bo 10 foot bamboo cane with every tree and that pretty much solved the problem because the pigeons would land on the top and then of course now the trees are bigger it's not an issue but it was just just an issue in the first few, three years so that's one to watch we have been monitoring pests and diseases in the trees themselves right the way through and continue to do so with sticky traps and pheromone traps and to be frank we don't really have any major issues that keep me awake at night a bit of wasp damage a bit of uh, a bit of weevil damage but but nothing that re really uh, really is a major issue and i think that's because it's not a monoculture it's very much a mixed system a polyculture and it looks after itself with a lot of wind flow and a lot of airflow and uh, on the flip side where we have problems you know, where we have had problems in the past with things like uh, leaf miners and um, uh, leaf beetles and, and uh, 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 um, beetles eating brass brassica crops etc uh, we get much less of an issue now because there are refuges in all these tree strips as Jeff said a lot of the nature ha uh, uh, exists at the edge and what we've done is created a huge amount of edge across the farm so there's a lot of habitat for beneficial insects and one of the bonuses there is is we've seen a huge increase in barn owls um, last year we off 100 hectares we fledged 13 barn owl chicks uh, three uh, kestrels and six uh, stock doves just out of barn owl boxes and to me that's a really good indicator that actually there's plenty of food for for things to actually uh, um, uh, to eat one thing I would encourage everyone to do if you're embarking on this is engage with colleges and universities they're all hungry for projects and they've got way more time and it's cheap labor to do research uh, way more time than I have so we've we worked a lot with Reading with uh, Warwick with Lincoln University on doing research and that validates some of the some of the mad thinking that we've got on the farm and we've seen some really really good results in, t uh, in published papers in terms of increase in solitary bees hoverflies bumblebee numbers species richness etc yeah i'm on the right slide um and and some of the headline sort of stories there were some of the work on understory uh, management around um, fewer aphid colonies, colonies lower fruit damage more pollination better income from having those those understories well managed rather than having them as a bare desert under the trees so so increasing that sort of those pollination services biodiversity services really has value <clears throat> and um, actually having ha that resulting in higher income uh, out from 15 of the 18 studies over a sort of 20 year period uh, which which our farm's been in that in that, that research as well uh, on on the ground we've seen a huge change in terms of soil so when we started farming on the farm 2007 soils were massively bacterial dominated they're now massively fungal dominated and we've been we've been tracking that with soil biological assessments uh, throughout and actually the trees have really helped with that they they bought they've they created a lot of stability for mycorrhizal uh, associations and we see a sort of a wave of mycorrhizae across the farm associated to where the tree strips are and that brings a lot of resilience and i think as climate change continues to uh, show issues with increasing temperature and uh, increasing challenges we're starting to see some of the benefits of that I initially thought that we would see in the tree alleys uh, higher crop yields in the middle and less yields nearer the tree edges and intuitively that's that was my thinking we're now seeing the reverse we're seeing better crops next to the trees uh, so for this for the sort of six to twelve meters out from the tree strip edges um, we actually see a higher crop so much so that I have to tilt the combine header and I think that's a mixture of better infiltration in the winter probably less evapotranspiration and water loss in the summer and definitely better soil conditions and, and mycorrhizal associations associated with those tree strips I mean you know a picture never lies but we actually I actually literally have to tilt the combine header and what was quite interesting is a uh, a, a shot here from a, a farmer friend of mine who has a very mature system down in in western France near Portier growing walnuts and um, uh, uh, and cereals and I've had this as a screensaver on my computer for over over a decade and you can start to see the same thing happening using the combine header head as a datum there where it's higher at the edges so maybe it's not just us 
what what the agroforestry does do is bring some resilience to the system and those of you that farm in the eastern counties may remember in 2019 we had very strong winds for a period of three or four days in the middle of harvest and that resulted in uh, quite a lot of mature crops literally threshing themselves in the field and losing a lot of grain onto the floor where we had fields that we hadn't harvested we lost up to 20 percent of the grain on the floor because of these high winds which obviously had a, a negative economic impact um in in the fields where we had agroforestry that was that was only about a five percent loss because we'd reduced wind speed at ground level which means we had less threshing so it, it pretty much paid for itself in that year um, just in terms of economic a smaller economic loss so it's bringing some resilience to the system but there's there's still lots of things we don't know i keep reading books on trees from people way cleverer than i am and and there's lots of uh information around saying that you know tree roots are talking to themselves the mycorrhizal associations are talking to themselves they're exchanging sugars and starches and, and not only between trees but between crops and trees and there's signaling signaling going on between canopies uh, under stress or under 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 growth conditions and we need to understand these things better and see how the the interactions occur so a cu couple of slides to just to finish um i suppose there's, there's a couple of unexpected uh, uh um uh, things that have happened which we never anticipated um security was a bit of an issue when you plant four and a half thousand trees you don't want them to uh be, be on the on the sunday market in a car boot sale uh, the week after you've planted them so putting gates in at, the, at field edges was something we had to consider um dry autumn uh, and, and these very dry springs we're having clearly is a bit of an issue which so you need to think about watering uh road safety massive issue for farming uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a major road we think every farmer in Cambridgeshire was sort of driving looking sideways like this what the hell's going I don't think we did anything for the road safety figures and we also became a bit of a, um, uh, a magnet or a honey pot for small light aircraft it just kept buzzing around us because it was something different on the ground well I quite like a few planes so that wasn't much of an issue and I think a bit of been asking the question of corporates 20 years ago which I did would you like to provide some money for biodiversity or carbon uh, uh, for me planting an agroforestry system in trees I, I got the door slammed in my face repeatedly and no one was interested and I think that would be a very different conversation today so there's an opportunity not only from government support but also from corporate support both in terms of CSR carbon and biodiversity to actually provide some income for these kind of systems because there's quite a quite, quite a good amount of data around actually uh, the, the amount of carbon that can be fixed with agroforestry systems we know from the measurements we've done that we're doing about four and a half tons of carbon per hectare per year on the trees that would equate to I suppose a hundred pound a hectare that's uh, that, that's going to help with the system but we need to put carbon and we need to put biodiversity on the balance sheet it currently isn't on a lot of our balance sheets on, on farming systems and it needs to be an integral part of our system <sighs> rambled enough so innovation adaptation is going to be key whatever you do on your farm agroforestry could be part of the mix you don't need to do the whole farm you can do a small component you can do a field but but think about uh, how it can can bring some some resilience to the farming system and if you do nothing else when you when you exit the tent just just stand for a second and look down at the ground and look up in the sky and realize that actually if you farm in a three-dimensional way you can actually make the farm much bigger don't tell my landlord because as soon as he starts i can make the farm bigger with no extra rent as if he charge, charges me on a per cubic hectare i'm i'm destroyed but but you can make the farm bigger and more productive and more resilient so thanks very much and i'll hand over to david Thank you very much. Uh, I can't do two things at once. Uh, my name is David Rose. Uh, I'm a farmer from Nottinghamshire, uh, and I want to do a presentation on um, on how we've used trees, but also how it's linked with a social enterprise called Farm Eco. And I want to explain how agroforestry has been a big approach uh, uh, to our farming system. And I just want to highlight a few things that went wrong, but I hope this presentation encourages you to go out there and want to plant trees. Next slide, please. 
So before you start planting trees, before you start getting involved at all, you need a vision. And I believe uh, we have a plan for our farm, but we need to include the future generations because the future generations are going to be the people that really benefit and get involved in that. So it's no use planting trees and then getting your kids to come and rip them out years later. My vision is to have a farming system that is economically sound, delivering environmental and social benefits that include health and well-being for the local economy as well. And I believe you can only do this in partnership with business, with advisors, but also involving the local economy. And then I think everybody can flourish. Next slide, please. So I hope this slide uh, shows the layout of Farm Eco. Farm Eco is a small tenanted uh, farm renting land from our family in a small village in the Vale of Beaver. So Farm Eco rent 80 acres and they have just started converting some of that land into organic, which I never believed I'd see on our farm, but it's encouraging so far. We also rent land on different parts of the farm that's not in organic conversion and maybe one day they could look to take over the whole of the 500 acres. So we have three main areas of agroforestry. One is the uh, strips of apple and nut trees, which is in the arable rotation. These are planted every 27 meters, three meter strips of, uh, of undersown with grass and then 24 meters of wheat or, or whatever that cropping is that year. Um, <clears throat> and that's working very well. That's been in for five years. And then we have uh, another 15 acre field this year, which is uh, more for biomass. Um, but also for, uh, we're doing a lot of hedge laying on the farm, so we're using a lot of the hazel and the willow for uh, biomass, for uh, hazel bindering and stakes like that. And then the third area is there's 20 acres uh, of grassland that we're grazing with sheep, and uh, that's got 4,500 of trees uh, producing something that is edible. The trees also provide a great uh, base for our forest school uh, and our forest church and a nature trail area. And Farm Eco also sublet to a worm farm and a sheep enterprise that are both using the woodland as part of their businesses. And all, are, all of these are con contributing to the economically sustainability area of the farmers. Now all the hedgerows that we've planted, and we've planted many uh, in the last uh, few years, are planted with uh, the local economy, the local community, um, schools, uh, the shoot is keen to get the shoot involved in, in, in what we're doing. Uh, and everybody then feels that they're part of it and gets involved and feels that they're community and, and they're part of the farming system that we're trying to create. Next slide, please. So why farm with trees? Um, I believe um, that you've either, people are saying we've either got to be large scale or we've got to be, or we've got to go wild. But I believe there's an area in between. Uh, and I believe that uh, nature-based solutions uh, can give a, a difference to climate change, to soil health, and to profitable farming that provides environmentally produced quality food. So trees can be a part of what we're producing uh, of our food system, but also tie in very well with our social enterprise. But like all these things, you need to get good advice, and I'm going to come on to that in a little while, get good advice before you actually start doing this and start enterprising your vision. But also make sure that your family involved right from the start. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges? <clears throat> so we're a rented farm, so the main areas of, of, of land that we've planted trees on our land that we, that we own ourselves, but we have now started working with the landlord and we're starting to put a lot of trees and hedgerows back into to him and having an agreement uh, in, in, in that area. Before you plant trees, again, have that vision, what are you planting them for? What are you going to be producing and what are the economic returns going to be before you start choosing what term what, um, um, trees that you plant because trees could actually have a negative effect if they're planted on the wrong wrong trees in the wrong areas <coughs> don't just pick plant trees to fix a short-term funding solution and don't just rely on trees as, don't just rely on trees it's a part of a solution not the overall solution you need to look at an overall farm and trees can be part of that and we don't have all the answers in, in the 10 years that we've planted and we've planted over 20,000 trees we're certainly learning, and every year as the weather changes, we're learning more and more. And it's what really important that we go out there and visit other farms to learn uh, as, we, as we progress. Next slide, please. Planning the system. Establishment, very in interesting. Um, and making sure that um, when you plant your trees, you get it organized and get your uh, plants in early enough. Uh, we always used to leave it till after the shoot season to get everybody involved. It's too late, really. You want to be planting in December 
uh, and January uh, to get that, them established. We've undersown also with a short mixture uh, <coughs> of, um, of grasses, but this year that struggled to come, but we had beans in the year before, uh, and uh, they provided a great um, habitat for the trees to grow in, and um, it, it worked really well. Also, as, as Stephen has said, make sure that you've got facilities for watering because we've had to water more than once uh, in, the, in, the, in the times that we've been planting. Understand your weather patterns. Before you actually plant anything, make sure you've gone into and researched the data. Make sure you know which way the winds are predominantly coming from uh, and, and plan for that. Uh, we've been involved in certain uh, data collection with the Organic Research Centre and that was really valuable and, and that report can be found uh, on our website. Um, and a key thing we've worked with as well is Tom Stanton from Reading University who's done research over the last three years and he's found that insects actually migrating from those alleyways into the middle of the crops beating up and scaring all the insect, bad insects away and we've now reduced it to having no pesticides and, and, and insecticides on, on those crops at all and we've got bug hotels scattered all up and down the, uh, the alleyways which the kids actually love to see when they're coming out. Next slide please. Livestock should be some pictures of some sheep there. Um, <clears throat> livestock on a farm, we've got longhorn cattle uh, and Shropshire sheep. Uh, like I say, we've got 20 acres of grass field, uh, four and a half thousand trees producing something edible to eat. And I don't just mean for the sheep. We've got apples to apricots, plums to quince, walnuts to sea buckthorn, uh, a, a real range of, of, of different trees. But the big, biggest challenge when you've got such a wide range of trees is the guarding, especially when sheep uh, like to climb all over them. Um, and that's been a major task for us, and I'm able to share that information if people want to learn. But uh, you've got to really look at the guarding systems to make sure that you're, you've got that in, in place. But I believe the best scenario for that is mob grazing uh, and try some Shropshire sheep. They seem to be uh, less vigorous attacking the sheep, the, the trees. Next slide, please. Um, producing uh, your vision uh, in our experiences. We have tried to produce apples um, and nuts to sell in our, uh, we've got a shop on the farm and we've got a gym, we've got a, a, a home, a home delivery system. But um, the problem is that it's the consistency of product uh, and the right time uh, to be able to deliver, to make it economically viable. Uh, the storage, food hygiene, volunteer commitments have all made it very different. Like we said earlier, in this farming, you've got to be either diverse or big. But we now run experience days on the farm and part of those experience days, we run health cares and, and, and well-being days, and tree, trees provide a tranquil area for delivering many of the events, including yoga and music events. And recently, we had 2,000 visitors for Open Farm Sunday, uh, and the Nature Trail uh, was very, very popular, and we can use trees for, for income that way as well. The next slide, please. This year's development, uh, we've planted some short rotation cropping, as we've said, which is hazel and willow. Um, Emma Shires, a volunteer who came to us, uh, wanted to grow heritage wheat. I say, okay, why, why not? We needed a market. She said she'd invested into a local bakery, and we're now growing heritage wheat under contract to her using the alleyways that we've got on the farm. We're also involved, uh, like um, Stephen said, with um, research projects at Reading and Nottingham University, as well as carrying out research projects with LEAF. One of the key factors for us that trees have been a major uh, impact on has been involving volunteers. We rely on vol volunteers in our community enterprise. Emma Shires came to volunteer. She's now running a heritage wheat enterprise. Uh, James <coughs> Thompson came, wanted uh, to get out of the rat race from Morrison's, came, started wanting to look at uh, uh, biodiversity and do an environmental degree, came and volunteered. A year later, he's now running, working for FWAG and he's set up a cluster group in Nottinghamshire looking after 20 farms, as well as being my key advisor on the farm. So get, people do want to get involved in farms and people do want get, to get you know, come out and help. We've got a, 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 res, a retired cancer research specialist who was the head of cancer research in Nottingham. He now has all our biodiversity monitoring and links into the uh, ac academic uh, research that we're doing. It's great to see these people and they are out there if you look for them. Uh, again, um, <clears throat> without great advice, th this can't happen. Next slide, please. Sorry, w Woodland Trust. Great advice. Uh, I've been inspired by many people in the Woodland Trust. Stuart, Helen, and all the team have, have been really, really helpful. Uh, got me involved with Stephen. But there's many more. If you're going to do a tree project, get out there and visit. Go see uh, Ag Agri Ben, uh, Wakelands, see Paul's visit after this. 
you can't just learn from it from you know here get out there visit farms come and visit us visit some of these other and learn from experiences summary last slide um <clears throat> I think all the uh, summaries on there, but it, I believe farming can, with trees can be economically viable. And while you read this summary, I just want to sum up by saying that regen is very, very popular. But it's been, we're only redoing what my grandfathers and my forefathers used to do before me. We should be recording and listening to the older generations, the grandparents, and actually understanding what they went through because we're going through similar things. And I believe regen itself isn't just the answer. It's a whole farm approach and you've got to find something that fits into your farming vision. Um, uh, the further backwards you look, the further forward you're likely to see, said Mr. Churchill, and I believe that's very, very poignant. Also, um, I've been a member of LEAF for uh, as long as it started, and Caroline Drummond was a big friend of, uh, of mine and has been very influential in our farming system. And the integrated farming approach is only what is, is the whole way we look at our farm, and trees are part of that. And if you get chance, Caroline's as a tribute to Caroline at 11.45 today at Speaker's Corner. Look involved, get involved with LEAF. It's a fantastic organization, and trees are just a small part of the overall farm approach. Finally, I'd just like to say, get out there. Find something that you really want to do. Plan it out. Understand the trees. Get involved with the community. There are many different ways of getting involved with trees. You know, don't just think it's your own. Get involved with your family. Get involved with the community. Find something you're going to enjoy. Find something you're going to be proud of for years to come, and you can make it happen. I hope I've uh, encouraged you to go out there and uh, learn about trees and get involved. If I can be of any more assistance, then get in touch with me through the website or find us through the Woodland Trust. Thank you very much for listening, and good tree planting. Oh dear, never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, all of you, for some really interesting chats. And we've now got a good 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So I hope you've all got lots and lots of questions to ask. And there is a microphone that's going to run around to you. So we've got two here, at least. So if you could just wait for the microphone, and then we can. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for really interesting talks. Um, a question, I guess, to the last two speakers, um, perhaps starting with Stephen. Um, it's impossible to talk about all of the many soil benefits that can be attained through this system. I wondered about your opinion on um, how well this system is suited to an organic soil. I can't remember when I last visited your farm whether you've got any drain peat, but there's a lot of discussion at the moment, as I'm sure you're aware of, how to deal with that sort of soil, and do you think that this system would be um, a good choice if you're looking to retain that uh, soil that potentially has, um, uh, yeah, th there is concern about it being lost due to various farming methods? Thanks, Elia. Um, I, yeah, it's an interesting question. A, a lot of academics, uh, um, and, and uh, commentators are wholly against tree planting on peats because they believe it will dry it out. But their, I think their vision is of upland forestry. Uh, and our experience is that actually uh, a low density of trees actually brings some real benefits in terms of reducing evapotranspiration and water loss and actually helps keep moisture in the soils, especially during the summer months. And I, I think also our memories are very short a lot of the peats, well, the peats, some of the peat soils that I farm on were for, formed by having trees present and having leaf litter over many thousands of years. And it was only in the 1600s when we cleared the trees and dug the ditches that the, some of those trees disappeared. So I think they have a role to play, but it's about right tree in the right place at the right density. Thank you, Stephen. Does anybody else want to comment on that? No. Nope. Okay, well, we'll move. There's another question, I think, very close to you. Oh, so my question is about the understory. Uh, if you were to start again, uh, there seems to be three options. Either you do the wildflower thing that you, Stephen, you've done, uh, or you do a white clover underlay, which I guess you have to establish the year before, or else you use a Mipex physical barrier. I don't know. If you were to start again, would you do the same, or which one would you choose, or what other options are there? 
Well, but both of you can answer that. So <laughs> I don't think uh, we'd change uh, on the agroforestry. Uh, in the arable fields, we put uh, grass and uh, wildflower mixtures, and that just takes over uh, takes over its own way in, in in years to come. You have to top it a little bit with um, for the thistles and things, but um, it depends what you're growing. So with apples, you have to be careful what you're picking and, and things like that. But with the um, biomass plants, we've just undersown it with grass that's not going to grow with lots of wildflowers, so we can crop it every five years. But I'm sure Stephen will answer the question a bit better than I can. Um, it changes anyhow whatever you plant it will change over over a decade so we we planted lots of wildflowers and, and legumes some have survived really well some of the sandfoins and lucerns and clovers have, uh, have come but we never put any grass in but there's lots of grass there now it just comes on its own um we did uh, uh, the, the different thing i would do i think is we're in an area where there isn't a lot of wood chip and if you've got access to wood chip i would I would mulch with wood chip around the base of trees to get them started. We used a geotextile, which worked really well uh, in terms of weed control. But then 10 years later, when you mow it, uh, it's really good at knackering bearings on the mower. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the second thing is that we've had some damage from voles, which like to live in a nice little dry condition under this nice bit of black mypex. Uh, but the flip side of that is means that there's lots of things for owls to eat. So... There's, there's a there's a positive and a negative. Uh, yep. Uh, one of the things we tried this year was uh, a sheep flock. We used wool, so we got the wool and we planted it around each tree, um, which was working really, really well. And obviously, hope that's keeping the moisture in. Uh, but we, it's only the first year we've really done it, so we, we haven't seen a lot of problems. But voles are are a big issue. You have to keep an eye on those, especially if the grasses are growing tall. M Martin, I know you've got um, agroforestry on your farm. Have you got any experiences you'd like to share? Well, yeah, we, we grow a lot of apples to sell direct, but the brambles take over. So grass is a real issue, and we, we use a um, Mypex-type solution, but it breaks down after a while, mm. and uh, the grass and the brambles come in, so we're having to strim or scythe around it. So it's actually having a machine which is good at doing that. But yeah. yeah. So like you say, it does get taken out. But I just see different going around different farms, and pe a lot of people use a white clover. They have to establish it the year before and plant the trees into that. Well, I thought that was quite, initially that's quite effective. But. Yeah, yeah, certainly I think, and I've got my colleagues in the back, but some of our schemes where they have established the, the, the understory first and then the following year. More questions, have we got more? I'm sure we must have lots more questions. Okay, one there and then we've got two at the front. Yeah, um, I'd like to um, just reinforce the thing about brambles. Um, that would be a major fear for me as a commercial farmer because everything I plant gets overtaken by them. Um, the other point is under drainage. Um, so with the roots get in and clog those up. And the third point is, uh, on your organic, uh, have you got experience of this working in a non-organic environment? OK, well, there's, I think, both questions for both David and Stephen. Do you want to go on the non-organic first, David? We'll do them in reverse. <coughs> Again, just on the on the drainage, we will put a subsoil blade down the row of e on the edge of each strip each year, just to do that. But we're not finding a, a big problem with that. The problem with us, though, with before we going organic, was is to get that a number of uh, the quantity to be able to sell a product. Um, as and um, it, so that's why we've had trouble getting the quantities to be able to sell to shops and and without it being blemishes or anything like that. So that's why the whole aspect of of, uh, of experience days has been really working well for us where they come out, pick the apples, take them back, make them into cider or apple juice and, and that's been economically viable. But your brambles is an issue uh, and we do have to keep it uh, topped and get rid of them every so often. But uh, it's like any crop, you've got to really take uh, care of it and look after it and, and nip that in the bud as soon as you see it coming through. Thanks. Stephen, do you want anything to add about particular yeah, Maybe your question was about the, the alley crop in between and yeah. being conventional. Am I, am I right? Yeah, um, being a, farming organic is not a prerequisite for this. There, there are way more farmers doing this uh, globally, conventionally. Clearly, you need to uh, select your, your inputs carefully, especially herbicides that, uh, and minimise drift. One of the interesting things is actually you get way more spray days because the, 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 uh, the wind speed at ground level is much lower when the trees are in place. 
So you can actually spray in the agroforestry when you, you wouldn't be spraying in open fields. Um, what was the second question? Drainage. Drainage. Oh, that was it. First question my landlord uh, asked is, aren't you going to bugger the drains? Uh, uh, but I found a really nice piece of research from actually from Canada. Um, and it's clearly you wouldn't go out and plant willow, uh, which would be qu quite invasive into drains. And selecting the right trees, if you've got under drainage as we have, is important. But it's all about drain maintenance. In the winter, the trees are dormant. They're not looking for water. And that's when the drains should be flowing. Um, if you've got broken drains or ponding, ponding water in the summer, the trees will go looking for water. So, so, so making sure your drains are free and running and well managed is really important. We jet ours every three years routinely to make sure there's no blockages and we've, we've not seen a problem. Okay, I'm just conscious of time. I know we've got at least three questions. And do remember, we've got Philippa and Jim and um, Jeff from the various agencies as well. So I've got a question here, another one over here, and one over there, definitely. Um, I'm glad somebody asked a question about the drains. So thank you very much. Um, Stephen, you commented that you're getting bigger yields next to your uh, trees. Have you considered um, putting another layer of trees in the middle to further increase that? Um, and also doing it on a larger scale with perhaps wider tram lines, do you think there's a, an optimum? Or does, is any, any alley of trees better than no alley of trees? Well, obviously, the answer is yes, any alley of trees is better than no alley of trees. Um, but um, we, we're running at 24 metres, uh, and there, there is a sort of, there is a, a, an optimum in terms of the tree height versus the alley width. Uh, once you get the tree height in excess of the alley width, you start start to get pressure on uh, resources and uh, productivity from shading. So, you know, we're at a sort of four meter tree with a 27 meter, 24 meter working alley, 27 between centres, and that's working really well. But I've seen things working really well with bigger trees up to 52 meter alleys. W works fine. Um, have I considered putting an extra row in? No, because I think that would that at 12 meters, I think would be too tight. I think we start to see some negative impacts. So it's about finding the right balance. You, you've got to think how big that tree is going to be at maturity, 10, 20, 30, whatever years hence. Jim, do you have any comments on from a forester's point of view in terms of doing alley cropping with timber trees and obviously with much greater height? Yeah, I think um, I've seen uh, examples, in, in, along with Helen, in, uh, in Perthshire in Scotland where they, they've grown uh, timber trees, if you like, rather than fruit trees. Um, and one of the questions I was going to ask you too is if, if, if it was your land, what would you plant and why? But I'll leave that for now. Um, I think uh, the relationship is between the canopy and the ground floor, be it grass or arable. So you've got to manage that. And I think that's where agroforestry is a dynamic system. You can't just follow a, uh, a rule book. And what you do here and where I am in Cumbria, you could do exactly the same thing with very, very different results. You might get that opposite effect of... Uh, of, of, of a drop-off in um, arable crops near the edge yeah. uh, up in Cumbria, whereas you, it's, uh, it's been really beneficial here. So I think it's a dynamic system, and you've got to manage it, as uh, David said. Thank you. Okay, I'm just conscious of time, so there's another question here, and then we'll go over to there. Thank you very much. Just a, a one on um, practicality of, of pruning, especially with fruit trees, the amount of effort and management time to, to you know, think of forward planning, but that can be quite interesting, and I'd like to know how, how efficiently people can ta t tackle that. David, do you want to go first, and then Stephen? It's a real, it's a real key issue, and uh, we thought we knew how to prune, but we didn't, and uh, we're now pruning a lot harder than, than, than we were originally planning, and we got quite a bit of different, uh, with the tr wind damage, but we keep them more under control, it's easier, and we're trying to get them to, a, uh, all, a lot of ours are heritage trees as well, old-fashioned trees, but we're trying to get them into a state that we can like a globe that we could pick and reach them from but it is a big issue and uh, you need the right advice on on that right from day one because as soon as you started planting them they're going to need care and, and pruning is a big issue uh, that you need to be trained on and get involved in straight away uh, to get rid of the branch material that you're saying the off the off cuts uh, we we try to take that that off if it's sizable and put it through the biomass the boiler we chip it and put it through the biomass boiler we have Stephen, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, well, labour is an issue full stop. Labour for tree management for 
fruit picking, whatever, it, it's an issue. Um, we have used manual labour and we've been pruning on a sort of three year, three, three and a half year cycle. And that's worked quite well with just a team of two or three of us. Big cuts rather than, you know, snippy, snippy. Um, and um, uh, we own, not only prune canopy, but we prune roots. So annually we prune roots as an absolute must because we want to train the trees to do what we want to do uh, above and below ground. Um, we, we below ground prune with a subsoiler every year. Uh, and uh, I think that's absolutely key to making the system work how, how we want it to work. Um, the offcuts we just leave in the row for nature. We don't do anything else with them. Thank you. And we've got definitely got one question over there. Yeah, just really quickly. Um, similar question to the Bruce gentleman, really about labour, especially with your fruit tree enterprise. I take it you've had your harvest from that, and how how have you found you know getting labour to to pick the fruit? I know understand that's a big problem at the moment. Stephen, do you want to go first? I mean, it hasn't been a problem at all. Um, uh, we deliberately designed the system so that we would be late picking after we, after a cereal harvest, and there's tend to there has tended to be quite a lot of labour around off the the vegetable farms at that time of year. Last year it was a massive issue, um, and I've already booked labour for this autumn, uh, although it's a lot more expensive. And frankly, we're we're looking at we we now retail everything ourselves rather than selling into a wholesale market, and I'd rather have a lower yield. And capture the value than than, ha than spend lots of money on labour and storage, which is the expensive bit. So we're quite happy now to have a slightly smaller yield and capture value, rather than actually um, go for full out yield. Okay, thanks, Stephen. I'm conscious of time. So has anybody got one last burning question on here? And then I'm afraid that will have to be the last one. I'm sure that you've got all sessions to go to that you want to get to. So who wants to have a quick go at that? Maybe Jim wants, might add something in a minute as well. Careful. There's a great book the Woodland Trust have done about the whole economics of, of, of trees, but you ought to look at that because it varies depending on where you are. But the, the ones that we're putting in this year are for our biomass plant and for hedge laying stakes. So you've, like I say, you've got to look at what's in your area, look at the market, talk to people, what's available, and plan those sales You know, four or five years hence and then look at it. But there are great opportunities as well uh, if you're in the right area. The question, the question was, was it, would it be economically viable if it, if it wasn't a fruit tree? Well, in my case, no, because my tenancy is not, not long enough. I, I, I couldn't wait 25 or 30 years for a, for a, for a timber tree because my tenancy would have expired. So, so that was a major driver for us. Jim? You yeah, I, um, I, I would ask um, both of you, uh, if you did plant timber trees, would you see the benefit in the crop still? Okay, you haven't got the uh, the, the the apple input, but uh, you've still got the benefits that agroforestry bring to the crop, um, and and that's the case with livestock farming. I I, I live and work in Cumbria, and uh, you know that's where you, you might not see too much um, income from the 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 agroforestry tree crop, if you like, but you might get lots of peripheral benefits from uh, shade, shelter, and all that sort of thing. Definitely, uh, for animals, uh, we, we see now in, with our sheep. Every sheep is going for a tree, and there's natural, uh, you know, ha natural habitat that they can go under and shade. It's huge beneficial in, in a lot of the grazing areas that we've got, and you see areas of that at the Agricultural Research Centre, and also lots of other areas that are, are doing that. Thank you, and I'd just like to say thank you very much to all of the speakers. Thank you all for coming. There's those of you who want to go on the walk, find Paul, who's going to put his hand up in the air. Um, if not, we're doing it again tomorrow. Please come and visit us at the Woodland Trust stand and Forest Commission and Natural England have got stands. And we've got another session on agroforestry at one o'clock tomorrow, which does clash with George Eustace, but it's all about the agroforestry test with DEFRA that myself, Stephen, um, and the Soil Association and Organic Research Centre have been doing. So it's an opportunity for you to come and tell us what you would like to see in Elm if you were to take up agroforestry. So again, thank you ever so much for your interest and your support today and have a good show. Thank you.